Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar, Talking Team webinar series, uh, the August version. My name is Nilu Parvinashtiani, and I'll be helping with facilitating today's webinar. Um, let me cover a few logistics before uh, we start off with the webinar. First of all, um, I wanted to mention that this webinar is being put together by Federal Highway, Paul Jordan and his team, so a big shout out and, and thank you uh, to the team and to anyone who has contributed to planning uh, this webinar. So this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on NOCO's website. To see the full archive of previous NOCO webinars, including the Team Series webinar, uh, you can refer to the useful links box that you see on this on your screen right now uh, through our YouTube channel. Um, also, I wanted to mention that um, uh, we do have a number of uh, case studies that covers a variety of topics on uh, TISMO, transportation system management and operations, uh, including a variety of team uh, case studies. So uh, feel free also to browse through those case studies uh, to find more resources. Um, this webinar is on listen-only mode by default, but we'd like you to stay engaged by using the question discussion pod, just like you're doing now to uh, sign in and uh, say your name. So for any comments or questions, um, you know, feel free to type those in that pod. Um, at the end of the webinar, uh, we'll cover the questions and uh, read them out loud one at a time, and uh, they'll be answered by the moderator and our presenters. Um, that is all I had with the logistics. Um, uh, so with that, I would like to hand it over to our moderator, Paul Jordan, to start us off. Paul? Thank you, Nilo, and thank you uh, to everyone that's joining today. Thank you to the Center of Excellence who keeps supporting us every month on this. Uh, Jim and I are uh, honored to to work with those folks and and uh, your, with you all and the presenters today. Um, we, uh, you know, this just so that you you um, uh, the concept. Uh, Nilo, I can't advance the slide. Um, the concept for this webinar series was uh, Jim and I, you know, we, we ran into so many cool things, uh, things people are doing throughout the country. We, you know, the nation should hear about this. And the, and the, and the speakers today I know, um, uh, uh, you know, are, are along those lines, so a lot of cool things. Um, I'll talk about the slide that's up here now in a second, but um, but today we have uh, Eric Gordon, who is the uh, assistant traffic engineer at, Flo at the Florida Turnpike, and I heard a, a nice presentation that he did on the various tow programs and their overall TIM program at the uh, ITS America Responder Day. So I thought he would he would be good. Uh, Jack Sullivan is a is a very well known um, expert on on TIM, and I'll talk more about him later before his presentation. Honored to have Jack here, who is uh, has been probably doing this uh, life-saving of responders on highways longer than anybody. And then uh, T.J. Kirkville, who is who is uh, with the Nebraska Department of Transportation, I was out there uh, um, this week. I heard some cool things that they're doing. So, um, but um, we'll get to those in just one second. Um, and, and before that, we're going to have uh, my partner in crime here at Federal Highway, Jim Ostrich who will uh, run through uh, some uh, a training, TIM training update, and also um, uh, national um, incident response. Um, but for now, my uh, shameless pitch, I'm very proud of myself for being ready for next month already. Um, you, you know, sometimes I'm not as uh, organized as I am this month. Uh, next month, we're going to be featuring um, three great presentations. John McClellan uh, is going to talk about uh, how he uses TMC um, video for to help with um, traffic incident management. He's a very well respected and very well known to us um, uh, Tim Tim program manager. Um, and then the Arizona has one of the best Tim programs in the country. And I recently heard about their um, formalized Tim Awards program. We're going to have Angela uh, Barnett, um, uh, also known as An Angela Roper, um, is who is the executive director of the Arizona. 
Towing and Recovery Association. And then, um, sorry, another a cool presentation as well on um, social media and Tim uh, by Ellen Kamakis, who will be presenting on that next month. So uh, there's a registration link, but uh, we'll be sending you an email as well, and we look forward to your participation on that one as well. So uh, with that, I will um, um, oh, just a reminder that um, the Talking Tim, uh, on the questions and answers, you have any questions during the um, during the um, pre presentations, just put them in the chat pod and we'll try to get to them, or, and uh, the presenter will try to answer the questions. Um, we're going to have a question and answer period at the end, but um, at the end of, of uh, not at the end of each presentation, but at the end of the, when everyone's done presenting. So with that, um, Nilo, we need uh, Jim's slides, I believe. Uh, it's uh, my friend and colleague and teammate, um, Jim um, Ostridge, will take it from here to give you some updates on Federal Highways Program. Thanks, Paul, and welcome to everyone. As Paul said, an honor to be a part of this program. Uh, all of you and many others that aren't here with us, uh, we've got a great uh, attendance today of 120, but I I long for the day that, that these webinars we've got into hundreds, if not thousands, uh, you know, joining us. But nonetheless, I'm starting off a little bit, you know, differently uh, nowadays with the webinars, and Jack and others will attest to these, uh, these statistics. But, and one of the main reasons that we do what we're doing, uh, it's, it's now been, well, we're going to start our ninth month of the year, and uh, the struck by fatalities, the responders struck by fatalities continue to grow. We just added three more, and you can see them here. Um, law enforcement actually, uh, you know, one above towing and recovery, which is, which is unusual and uh, horrific nonetheless, firefighters, EMS. Um, I've added to the to the slide here the actually DPW and other in addition to uh, we had the DOT and the Safety Service Patrol, uh, but I think it's worth uh, keeping. Uh, it's the way I'd I'd like to display the stats uh, for those, even though right now I I know and we know of of none, which is a good thing. But if you by chance know uh, of of one of those three, uh, uh, please let us know. And um, it it has to be, or it should be, I said, for the time being. We're going to come out with a, a a definition that we'll share here in the coming weeks uh, for everyone to to understand what qualifies as a responder struck by. But in essence, it's it's. Uh, responders in the course of duty working uh, an incident regarding a crash, a fire, medical emergency, uh, as well as uh, you see mobile mechanics that are that respond to incidents that are that are out. It doesn't have to be an interstate or freeway. It can be a, a, a small town roadway, an urban roadway, and and other facility. But uh, it's it's a challenge to capture these numbers. So if you if you know of any uh, outside of these, please do let us know. And and let's remember that this is one of the important reasons that we do what we do. Next, I'm just going to give an update as of uh, two days ago. Congratulations to everyone. We we continue to grow the training numbers across this land, and. Um, uh, we are now over 427,000 responders trained. Uh, that's been seven years. It's a great number in our march to a million, as we as we like to say, which is actually over a million. And you'll see what I mean in the slide coming up. Um, but I always bring light or shed light on the fact on the first bullet up at the top, the train the trainer sessions. The fact that we've trained over 12,000 trainers, instructors, to, to deploy this training across this land, and only 23% of them are training, uh, 435 sessions, obviously, to train them. But just think about, think about that. If, 
if 35 or 50 percent or 60 percent of that 12,248 were training where we'd be today uh, as far as the numbers. I'm not trying to be critical. It's just sad for me, um, and I get it. This is just the, the nature of the beast and, and how education, if you will, occurs. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we count everyone. We try to count everyone. Uh, but as Paul and I always say, we're, we're, we're in the rears probably 15, 20, 25 percent, truth be known. Next slide here is uh, basically just shows the national picture as of the 26th. Uh, the number on top is those trained in person. The number below is those take, that have taken the four-hour course in an e-learning or web-based fashion. Still an option to, for you to consider and share with your stakeholders. Uh, stop. I ask you, me personally, I, I ask the, the community, you know, to, to stop this, this position that, you know, you're only going to offer it or only going to train responders or suggest the responders to take it in person. Yes, Paul and I get it. We know it's the best way to take a training, and for that matter, any training, right? Uh, but taking it online, whether it's through respondersafety.com, uh, that Jack Sullivan leads the training, is the training director for it. We'll hear from in a minute. But also through the host, uh, the Training Arm of Federal Highway, the National Highway Institute. And I always like to share the course number. Uh, if you just Google course 133126, uh, letter A, it'll take you right to the course. And by the way, these are all free and, and always have been. And uh, again, web-based training is, is an option to, to reach responders as well. Next is the, uh, the total train by state. You can see the tremendous work that Texas and California and so many states are reaching, uh, reaching their goals. Following that, here's the infamous goal map, of which now we're at 18 states. I'm proud to report that 18 states have met this 45% goal of their responder population trained, uh, met or exceeded it, actually, and you can see the numbers there for yourself. Uh, these slides will all be available to you, and if anybody uh, uh, that is not, you know, so familiar with the program, pre please reach out to Paul or myself. We're always, we're always here to serve and, and willing to talk and share um, our knowledge. Next is, and I apologize for this blurry slide. I had to take a snapshot and didn't didn't come out as clean and crisp as it should. Um, but here you see the breakdown totals by discipline, um, wanted to share that. Fire, if you combine fire rescue with EMS, they, they nudge out law enforcement. But here again, of that 1.158, uh, and I'll go back real quick. If you go back to this slide, if you look down here in the lower left, you'll see the total number. Uh, for the national picture, 1.158 million 265 uh, that we're trying to train, but it's truthfully closer to 2 million. Uh, lastly, I think here I'm getting to, to the end. I want to share, and some of you already are involved with our planning calls that are, next slide will be more specific on, but uh, coming up in about I think it's 10 weeks away, 11 weeks away is the, uh, November 10th through the 16th every year, the second week in November. We celebrate, commemorate National Traffic Incident Response Awareness Week where we highlight everything that we're doing to, to protect the public, protect motorists, uh, improve the quality of life in our nation, uh, con mitigating congestion and everything else in between re relative to uh, uh, roadway reliability, traffic operations. Uh, our, log our slogan this year is safety is a team effort and traffic emergency actions matter. This banner that you see here, Paul and I put together, and you can see in the middle the national logo uh, that was developed by our uh, executive leadership group and then all the partner associations that support the TIM program. There's actually a few that are 
that are not shown here. And lastly, uh, here is the slide showing our uh, all states planning calls that many of you, as I said, uh, are attending and seeking out individually through your agencies, your PIOs, your CIOs, as many of the, your public affairs uh, team members to help you promote and come up with ways and means to participate and educate the public, not only during this important week in November, but quite frankly, it should, it should be on a regular basis. Our next one coming up is September 20th. And it says 17th, but I'm pretty sure it's the 20th. I apologize if that's that's the case. But you'll receive uh, you'll receive a uh, a notice about this. So look for the upcoming announcement and please join us. So with that, thank you and be safe and God bless always. Paul, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Yeah, I think Jim the seventh. The 20th is on a Friday, so it wouldn't be that day. So it probably is the 17th. Okay, thanks, Paul. So um, <clears throat> our next presenter is um, Mr. Eric Gordon. He's uh, Assistant Traffic and Operations, <coughs> excuse me, Engineer at the Florida Turnpike, um, which is part of the Florida DOT. Uh, he's worked there for 16 years, has held multiple um, assignments within the Traffic Operations Program, including traffic um, traffic incident management I, um, I Florida Turnpike and Florida DOT as well have long been le leaders in traffic incident management and um, so we, you know we do feature them um, periodically you could pick you know all, all many areas within Florida that, that are um, that do some great work they make some significant investment in their Tim program and um, uh, today I thought would be a good a good Focus would be to have Eric present on on how on his world at, with the with the Turnpike and how they how they uh, Tim and some of their towing programs. Which uh, with that, Eric, could take it. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to present on behalf of, like you said, Florida Turnpike and uh, the Florida Department of Transportation uh, (FDOT). Um, today, I just wanted to highlight a few areas of our program. Um, hopefully, uh, this might get you thinking about some areas of your own programs that uh, maybe you can take a look at. Um, so I hope this is uh, beneficial to you all on the call. Um, we'll just follow a few things, the three areas of our program. Uh, first, we have the Specialty Towing and Roadside Repair, or STAR program. Uh, we'll give an overview of that, some background information, and also uh, wanted to highlight the fact that we see it as a, a better alternative for uh, the, the traditional tow rotation system uh, here at uh, Flores Turnpike in Florida. Um, also, a uh, part of that program we call the Florida Highway Patrol or FHP Emergency Tow Program. So I have a few slides that I, I wanted to give some examples of, of that and how we're using that to keep our customers and emergency responders safer. And also, uh, lastly, we'll talk about, uh, many of you may have heard of, of this program, the Rapid Incident Scene Clearance Program. Uh, we're going to get some 2019 um, updates, you know, how many events we've had. Uh, one of the changes in that risk program is uh, we've gone from multiple vendors per sector, and we're going to go with uh, one vendor per sector. And I'll kind of explain a little bit of that in, uh, once we get to those slides. So the STAR program, uh, the overall goals, uh, we just, uh, across our system, we want to increase travel time reliability. Um, this is all about keeping uh, ex expedient, safe, and efficient towing services across the system and helping reduce secondary crashes. Um, this might be timely. Um, we use it as a key component of the Turnpike's emergency evacuation plan. Um, an example from a couple years ago was Hurricane Irma. Uh, we utilize the STAR program to really keep our roadways clear. Uh, we had uh, a lot of traffic trying to move north, trying to move west, away from Hurricane Irma, and uh, it's very likely that we'll institute some similar uh, aspects of the STAR program for um, a little storm called Dorian that's out there uh, hovering out in the distance. So that really, uh, really helps us out, really keeps vehicles off the roadside, because even when they're on the shoulder, they can impact traffic. Uh, for the STAR program, uh, we use one-year contracts up to three one-year renewals, so they 
have up to a four-year span to be a um, uh, program, part of our system. Uh, it's cost neutral for the turnpike, in fact. Um, each vendor pays an annual permit fee to be part of the program and to be a non-exclusive, um, have the non-exclusive privilege of being the vendor within the sectors, and I'll show you the sectors here in a minute. Um, dedicated tow vendors for all record classes, and we also uh, recognize the fact that the turnpike system, we have a number of urban areas, um, we have a number of rural areas, so we do allow, um, or there is a, an expectation of a, a little greater response time needed for those rural areas. Uh, about 45 to 55 minutes. Vendor selection is competitive bid. Um, the performance is measured and communicated regularly. So our incident management team will meet with our vendors on a regular basis to make sure that um, checking their facilities, we'll inspect their facilities, we'll inspect their vehicles. We want to make sure that each and every vendor has the proper training and their personnel are certified to be a vendor on the system. Um, Authorized star vehicles are also um, identified by a decal on their vehicles. In terms of the sectors, we have approximately 12 sectors here. Um, some of our vendors are listed and um, thought it would be a little bit better. Hopefully you can see it. Um, all the roadways in green are actually a part of the Florida Turnpike system. Um, so we go all the way from Central Florida down to South Florida and we even have some facilities on the West Coast. Uh, in the Tampa area. So we cover quite a bit of ground and in this uh, map you can see um, we have some different response times. They vary from 25 minutes in the very congested areas to like I said about 55 minutes for areas that are fairly rural in nature. Some of the highlights of the program include um, we started in 2009, June 15th. Um, over the course of that time there's been about 78,000 uh, tow calls answered. On-time performance, so this contract is all about performance. Uh, performance is measured and it's recorded. And on-time performance, is their, um, each vendor, there's a high expectation that they're going to be on time to every event that they get called for. And 90.4% 90, 90 of the time that they are on time. Uh, their average response time across the system is 20 minutes and 32 seconds. And uh, like I said before, we just see it as a kind of a better alternative to uh, the tow rotation that has been in place um, for a number of years. And I'll explain that flexibility in a moment. Um, so for last year, just to give you an idea of the a number of events across the system, last year we had 8,955. And so far this year, we're tracking at um, 5,179 um, events. And uh, so you can see each year by year, when we first started, of course, we had a little bit less in 2009, but uh, we've had a you know, steady increase since 2014. And the average arrival time, this is uh, the, the program average, uh, like I said, is about a little under 21 minutes across the system. And although the response average arrival times do vary year to year, uh, they don't vary significantly. Uh, for the most part, our vendors have been able to keep a, a pretty good uh, response time, arrival time going across the system. In terms of terminology, we use things like InstaTow. Um, this is being used. Um, previously, there was a bit of delay, uh, a, a scene, a crash scene. We might have to wait for a trooper to show up. Uh, InstaTow gives us the ability to dispatch um, a wrecker immediately while coordinating with FHP. You know, especially for a scene that we know is going to need a wrecker. Um, I'll skip around a little bit. The FHP emergency tow. Is, I'm going to explain a little bit more on, on a few slides later. Uh, we have the ability to tow uh, our own turnpike or FHP vehicles that might need assistance. Um, we can also direct uh, vehicles to impound lots. And actually, a, a lot of uh, what the star vendor is able to do as well is a debris pickup. Um, there's, there's a decent amount of debris that gets out there on the system. And, uh, and, and even if um, they show up to a scene and the owner makes their own arrangement. We also have the ability to use the STAR program to clean up the crash debris, which is real helpful. In terms of the emergency tow program, um, like I said before, uh, a lot of motorists are actually in our Florida Administrative Code 15B and some other um, laws. They have the ability to make their own arrangements for assistance. Um, Given the, the fact that our system is so big and we have a lot of rural areas, uh, some parts of our program, there are 50 
40 to 50 miles between interchanges. Um, our team has really been proactive in, in making this a, a part of our program. Uh, this assistance is free to Turnpike motorists on the system. So when we initiate this, a star vendor is dispatched by the FHP vehicle to take that vehicle to the nearest service plaza. Um, across the 300 miles uh, center part of our system, we call the Turnpike Mainline, we have service plazas every 40 minutes. Uh, what would happen in the past is someone may be, might be on the side of the road making their own arrangements for hours. Um, in this case, we can initiate an emergency tow program, take them to a much safer place at one of our service plazas where they can have a little bit of convenience, um, they can use the restroom, uh, they, they have the ability to do that while uh, waiting for their uh, arrangements to arrive, you know, whatever arrangements they've made. Um, give it a quick example. Uh, here's some of the background. Um, you know, we just, uh, we just, we, we, we do um, appreciate the fact that many owners want to make their own arrangements, but this, uh, this gives us the ability to help them make their own arrangement in a much safer way. And one great example in March 2019, um, one of our road rangers encountered a mom and a young child broken down in a, a very rural section of the turnpike. Um, the road ranger went on to check on them multiple times, uh, even gave them a sandwich from his own lunch. So eventually what we did was uh, we initiated the emergency tow program, took them to the nearest service plaza so they could wait there for assistance. And we felt like that was a much uh, safer arrangement to, we still helped them out. So uh, we didn't want to wait any more hours than they had already been waiting. Uh, for the risk program, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, like I said, we've, we've gone on this program we used to have multiple vendors per zone. We break apart our system into zones. Uh, now we're going with single contractors. So this is actually out for procurement right now. Um, uh, we uh, look to have our, our field rep at all the risk events. Um, we are using an RFP selection process, a request for proposal for, uh, to try and obtain a quality operations. We've changed our incentive payments. So we've um, increased our incentive payments. And then we also have separate incentives for response and clearance. And for the risk program, uh, there's probably a lot of information about this online. Um, uh, every, all the districts, all the agencies in Florida uh, generally have the risk program in place. And just to give you an idea of how many events we've had, this is for large vehicle um, incident management. Uh, last year we had 134, which is a record in our program. 134, that's about a, a 11 per month. Uh, which is steadily increased from 2010. And this year, we've actually had 83, um, at least 83 as of today. Um, so we had 79 a few days ago. So quite a few events. Um, this is another tool in the toolbox for us, the risk program. Been a great program for a number of years, since I think 2003 or 2004, before his turnpike. And uh, for here we track uh, all the different Performance measures, you know, activation, arrival, notice to proceed, the NTP, and the clearance. And, uh, you know, we, overall, the floor, state of Florida has an open roads policy of 90 minutes. And uh, this program helps us to achieve uh, our open roads policy goals and uh, clear up these large uh, vehicle incidents much, much quicker. So uh, additional information, some of my contact information is above. And then also uh, our incident mo management program is led by Mike Washburn. And, uh, you know, so really my, my presentation is a testament to the, the fantastic uh, program managers and folks working on our program that uh, are carrying the incident management uh, <coughs> programs forward. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Eric. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah, Mike, Mike Washburn has been around a long, long time as well, and he's, um, he's done some, uh, some great work. Um, uh, and uh, I know we had a big, deep conversation with him. Um, I think it was about six months ago at the National Fire Academy on, on some, uh, on some towing issues. Thanks again, Eric. And uh, our next presenter is uh, Mr. Jack Sullivan, who is retired. Um, volunteer firefighter with uh, 25 years of service. He's now um, director of training in, um, uh, for the Emergency Responder Safety Institute. I don't know if folks know who that is, the, but the Responder Safety Institute has um, almost on a voluntary basis has done some tremendous things um, in um, uh, 
uh, with training and uh, and all kinds of uh, responder safety. Um, Jack is is uh, well. It says uh, that he's a, a subject matter expert, but I I consider him to be the subject matter expert on roadway incident operations and emergency responder safety. Um, and he always is promoting pro proactive strategies and tactics for pro protecting emergency workers. Uh, it's been a great passion of. Jacks for some time, um, responder safety. He's also uh, held ver various positions with national committees and organizations. He's a very respected um, advisor. Uh, and he's also been one of our master instructors for the Tim Responder Training Program, the National Tim Responder Training Program. So with that, it's a great honor to introduce uh, Mr. Jack Sullivan. Jack. Thanks, Paul. You're making me tired already. Gee. <laughs> Uh, can you see my screen okay? Is the slide up and can you see it? Yes, sir, it is up. Yep, All go, right, ready to good. go. So I've got just a few minutes here. They they told me I had to limit my time to 20 minutes today. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do that, and uh, I'm probably going to raise some questions for all of you. I'll tell you in advance. Uh, write down my email address. If uh, there's something that I can follow up for you after the uh, presentation today, I'll be glad to do that. My email address is respondersafety at gmail.com, all one word, respondersafety at gmail.com. And what they asked me to talk about today was enhanced visibility, or what some people call conspicuity, of emergency vehicles when they're working roadway incidents. And this has been a, an issue that we've been trying to address at the Emergency Responder Safety Institute for a while now because of uh, the number of struck by incidents that occur uh, where emergency vehicles police, fire, EMS, safety service patrols, tow trucks, all kinds of vehicles with flashing lights and fancy graphics continue to be hit by drivers who, in many cases, are literally not even looking out the windshield these days. So uh, we're frustrated by some of that, and, and uh, what we've tried to do over the last 20 years is to encourage um, a variety of strategies to make our vehicles more visible to at least those drivers who are paying attention out on the roads and highways. So many of you have probably noticed on the back of fire apparatus and some ambulances in the, in the last 10 years or so an increased use of what we call high visibility chevrons. Those are the uh, stripes that you see on the back of uh, the emergency vehicles. Um, the National Fire Protection Association created some guidance on the type, color, size, and orientation of those chevrons a few years ago. And this uh, engine that you see from Charlottesville, Virginia, is a good indication of what the code or standard calls for right now in uh, the NFPA standards. It's NFPA 1901 for those of you that might be interested. There's been a movement over the last few years, though. People tend to uh, want to have their own colors and designs. And uh, they have started to do things like what you see on the screen now. I personally don't care what color you put on the back of your vehicle, but I would tell you in our experience in looking at this issue over the last 20 years or so, that if you do choose to put some sort of chevron pattern on the back of your emergency vehicle, that we recommend that it meet the test of being fluorescent and reflective. And neither of these two examples that you see right now meet that criteria. The fluorescent colors are important for daytime, daylight type visibility conditions. The reflective features only help us at nighttime. Both of these vehicles do not have fluorescent features. And that's not to say that you can't see them out on the highway, but fluorescent colors do a much better job of catching people's attention from a distance as they approach an emergency scene on the highway. So the color combinations are not as critical in my mind as long as the colors that you choose meet the criteria of being fluorescent and reflective, as you see in this example here. This is coming out of Montgomery County, Maryland. This is an example on the back of an ambulance where the color combination was a little bit different, but still meets the criteria of being reflective and fluorescent. And this is a Wake County EMS unit. This is a little bit older photo at this point, but this is the color combination that they use for the chevrons on the back of their units. And I think that meets the objective of what we're trying to do. This is what the color combination would look like uh, according to the NFPA standards. And this is what we started to see uh, many years ago when chevrons were first starting to be deployed here in the United States. And the reason why NFPA decided to put together a standard 
because we started to see different orientation of the stripes, different widths of the stripes, different color combinations, and even some things like this that we decided just was not what we were trying to do uh, out on the highway. Too many people look at this and say, yeah, it kind of looks like a target out there. Um, and I believe this picture here was probably the single most influential piece of why NFPA decided to create a standard to provide some guidance on the type of chevrons that we put on the back of emergency vehicles. There is some uh, movement right now as the NFPA 1901 standard is being revised to change the requirements for colors on the back there. Our suggestion is that they keep it the way it is. Uh, one of the reasons they did it that way a few years ago was that so that all of the vehicles are uniform across the country. And as you know, one of the things that we hear constantly from people around the country, especially those folks that spend a lot of time on the road, like truck drivers, um, the color combinations of emergency warning lights vary from state to state. And it's not always uh, easily discerned by the drivers out there if when they're approaching blue lights, red lights, amber, yellow, white, green, uh, even purple lights in some places, they're not really sure what that means depending on the state that they're in and things like that. So we spent a lot of time looking at warning lights and how to make best use of them at emergency scenes. I think it's uh, pretty well accepted around the country at this point that when we're working a nighttime incident scene, we really need to concentrate on managing our warning lights, turn off forward-facing white lights at nighttime, and try to create a work environment where the uh, lights that we're using on scene help to illuminate the work area, but not create a glare issue for those drivers that might be operating in the area and passing by the incident scene. And as uh, technology has advanced, we've seen an increase in the use of LED emergency warning lights. Uh, they are stronger now than ever before. They are extremely bright, have all kinds of different flash patterns and color combinations. And one of the things that we've heard loud and clear from motorists and truck drivers and others out on the roadways, especially at nighttime, our warning lights can be part of the problem in some situations where the intensity, frequency of the flash, or what we call latency or modulation of the lights uh, creates a distracting atmosphere for the drivers who are operating in the area. So when we talk about intensity, we're talking about the brightness of the warning lights. When we talk about frequency, we're talking about the flash pattern, how fast it is, uh, whether it bounces from side to side or top to bottom or is consistent around the uh, perimeter of the vehicle. And when we talk about latency or modulation, we're referring to as the light flashes, it's the difference in the lighting where the flash either goes completely off or remains at a glow during the off time. And what we found in some of the testing that we've done recently that I'll show you in just a second that latency really makes a difference. If you leave it at about 10% of the peak intensity of your emergency warning light capability during the off or down time, the light should never fully extinguish, but it reduces in the intensity so that it creates an outline of the vehicle that's easily discerned by drivers who are approaching the area. And I'll show you some examples of that. As the lights got brighter, though, uh, much like we saw years ago when strobe warning lights first came out, a lot of people complained about them being too bright at nighttime. Many of the manufacturers provided a low power or high power switch on their uh, light control box so that at nighttime the intent was that the operator of the vehicle could manually dim the lights a little bit using the high power, low power switch. Um, many of the systems have that as a standard feature. Others require you to pay extra to enable that feature. Um, if you have a control box on your emergency lighting system for your emergency vehicle, you might want to check and see what the capabilities are. If you have an older system and have not had the capability to upgrade the system that you're using. Massachusetts State Police got frustrated a few years ago when a number of their troopers were struck out on the roadways at various types of incidents, and they started working with some of the emergency lighting manufacturers to come up with some potential solutions. And this particular demonstration that I hope you can see on your screen at this point um, shows the emergency warning lights on the rear of a state trooper's vehicle. This is probably about eight years ago at full intensity. This is what they typically look like when they were parked at the side of the road. In working with one of the manufacturers, though, they came up with what they refer to as a flicker mode 
which was meant to be a little bit less distracting, all of the emergency lights on the back of the vehicle come up at a lower intensity level, and instead of a dramatic flash pattern, they tend to flicker. They found that this was pretty effective. It caught people's attention from a distance, but it was not as distracting for the drivers who were trying to pass by the incident scene in that particular emergency vehicle. With new technology, and I'll, I'll thank the uh, folks at Wheelan for sharing this particular video, the new technology has allowed them to do some other things without the driver actually interfering. So the operator of the emergency vehicle doesn't have to do anything other than in a case like this with a traffic stop. Uh, this is the standard lighting package that we're all used to having. It's LED, it's extremely bright, dramatic flash pattern, very distracting for others that might be driving by. In this particular case, now when the police officer puts his vehicle in park during the traffic stop, the warning lights automatically dim down to some extent based on ambient lighting. There's an ambient light sensor that can be included in the package. It dims the lights to an appropriate level, changes the flash pattern from an overly dramatic pattern to a little bit more easygoing pattern. It's easier for people to see the vehicle and more importantly to be able to see the police officer walking around the vehicle or operating at the scene. Um, Jim Stopa at uh, Wheel and Engineering shared this video with us to kind of illustrate what we have in one test fire truck in the country at this point. This is uh, out of Killingworth Fire Department in Connecticut where they've tried three different flash patterns. The first one is the typical dramatic, very bright flash. And then what they did was slow the flash down and in this case here, leave that latency at about 10% so that you still continue to see the outline of the vehicle. This is what many fire trucks look like to uh, an operator coming by the scene today. This was one of the patterns that they tried, but notice that the lights go out completely in the down cycle. And the one that was most effective that we found was this combination here, where the latency doesn't dim the lights any more than about 10% of the peak power and shows the outline of the vehicle when they're parked on the side of the road. Unfortunately, we can't do this on all of the fire trucks just yet because the NFPA standards haven't caught up to the technology. So we've got to do some uh, work with the NFPA folks to have them allow fire apparatus and EMS equipment to utilize some of this new LED technology that's out there. In November, we were up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and we did a, uh, a voluntary study with about 75 people uh, using one of the manufacturers who brought some light fixtures out for us, they demonstrated about 65 different flash patterns, intensity, frequency, and latency, and sought feedback from the people who were witnessing this test in terms of the type of flash pattern, if it was alternating side to side like you see here, or if it was more dramatic but at a lower intensity on the flash, what we were trying to determine is what is most effective in outlining the emergency scene and letting people know something's going on without being so bright and distracting and dramatic a flash like you see here that it's disconcerting to the people who are trying to go by the incident scene. We've got to remember that emergency lighting simply tells people, look out, we're here. And when we talk about traffic incident management, one of the things we're trying to do is to get people to follow our instructions and go around the incident scene which the warning lights themselves don't necessarily do. Some departments are starting to go back to uh, elevated lighting fixtures, like this one coming out of Ohio, the Loveland Sims Fire Department. Uh, they added in these uh, um, extended sticks on their emergency warning lights that gets the warning lights up higher than the emergency vehicle itself. So supposedly it can be seen from a further distance to get people's attention. And in this case, you'll also notice that they have a left arrow engaged to try and give the uh, motorist an idea of which direction they have to go to pass on, by the uh, incident scene as they approach. We've encouraged fire apparatus manufacturers and those people that are specking them out to add arrow type devices on the back of the emergency vehicles. We've suggested that they get them up as high as possible above the hose beds where, wherever it's uh, potentially available. Um, make sure that it's as high and as bright as can be seen from a further distance, and not to depend so much on just the emergency warning lights, but to try and provide some sort of direction for the motorists as they approach the incident scene, which way they need to go to 
safely pass by the incident scene and avoid the responders that are working on the side of the road. Uh, some of the departments have actually experimented with installing these arrow devices on the side of their apparatus. Those of you who have been through the TIM Sharp 2 training know that one of the things that we talk about is using large emergency vehicles for a block uh, at incident scenes by parking them at an angle upstream of the actual work area. When you do that, the arrow device on the back of the uh, emergency vehicle might not be as bright and attention-getting as those that might be on the side of the vehicle, like you see in this particular example here. Um, getting mixed reactions from people on that. Uh, sometimes they seem to be effective, sometimes not so much. A lot depends on the type of roadway. Some departments have actually experimented with trying to install DOT-type arrow boards on the top of their fire equipment. Uh, that's, this can be problematic for a variety of reasons, mostly because of the other equipment that's on the truck or has to be accessed on the truck. Uh, it's difficult to find a stationary place on the truck to mount one of these that it doesn't interfere with some other capability of the truck. A number of departments have been fortunate to get grant money through the Firefighter Safety Grant Program that FEMA has to actually retrofit their vehicles with uh, message boards or arrow boards or a combination of the two, like you see here from Minnesota. They also got grant money to retrofit the reflective chevrons on the back of their vehicles in this particular case, and my understanding is that this particular department runs out on the interstate on almost a daily basis. So they weren't so much concerned about the appearance of the truck uh, as they were the ability to communicate messages to oncoming traffic out on the highway so that people knew that there was an incident up ahead and which way they needed to go to avoid the incident. In Livonia, Michigan, uh, they've equipped all their battalion chief's vehicles with this flip-up arrow board that's part of the emergency warning light package on the roof of the vehicle. And what they're doing now is using the BC's vehicle, the battalion chief's vehicle, as an advanced warning vehicle at an incident scene. He can actually flip up this board and activate the arrow in one of either the left or right direction or both sides as they approach an incident scene. Michigan DOT was good enough to share this particular video clip with us. There's been an incident on the highway. You can see it's a multi-lane freeway in this particular case. There's an ambulance on location. Law enforcement's on the scene. As you watch the uh, left shoulder, you'll see an engine that's approaching the scene that's going to take the blocking position that we talk about uh, for protecting the work area of the incident scene. And shortly after the engine arrives on the scene, you'll see a battalion chief approaching the scene also coming up the left shoulder and you'll notice that the arrow board that I just showed you is already up and operating and directing traffic to the right in order to move away from the incident scene and be able to pass by safely. And he'll park his vehicle back a little bit further to act as the advanced warning vehicle in this particular case uh, to give people an indication of which way they need to go. And I think that's one of the things that we've got to look at is how can we provide better direction to the motorists out there as to what we want them to do as they approach an emergency scene and not just have so many flash and warning lights that um, they, they can't necessarily tell beyond the flashing lights what's going on. A number of fire departments around the country have tried some innovative ideas to put this idea out on the street. House Springs Fire Department in South Carolina recently added the truck that you see here in the upper left-hand corner to uh, their stable. It is uh, specifically for traffic control at emergency incidents. It's got its own message board on the back, lots of cones, the high visibility chevrons. This will be their advanced warning vehicle at an incident scene, uh, hopefully to keep people from running into full-size fire apparatus. Up in the northeast, we've got fire police that are equipped with vehicles like you see from the Gettysburg Fire Department. Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan are my heroes for coming up with the idea of what, what they refer to as utility two. Uh, they took a dump truck and retrofitted it with an arrow board and an attenuator trailer on the back for traffic control at incident scenes on the interstate that runs through their city. And uh, in the last couple of years, the Irving Fire Department in Texas has got a lot of attention for retrofitting some of their reserve apparatus to be used strictly for traffic management. They've taken all the firefighting equipment off of the truck and added arrow boards on both sides and on the back to provide the, the motorist with some sort of an indication of where they need to go. If you're interested in getting some of the details um, of what's going on 
uh, with the uh, study that we did in Harrisburg, the report is available to you as a download uh, today, or it's on the respondersafety.com website, and uh, you can access the information there also. We've got some recommendations that might be of interest to you that uh, reflects what we learned from the study that we did, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to learn more things as we work on this subject and continue to look for more and better solutions going forward. Paul, that's all I've got on this. Excellent, Jack. And I know you have much more on many other things, so we're going to have to have you come back again because I know you, you do a lot in a lot of uh, other topics, but um, this one we thought was uh, was of interest and something different. Um, we're trying to mix it up quite a bit. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking while we're, you know, with everybody, um, uh, while we're looking at all the participants, and, you know, I, I see some, some law enforcement folks up there. Uh, I don't know if any firefighters are up there. I, I know a lot, of, a lot of DOT and transportation folks. So I want to challenge everybody on the webinar to try to reach out to some of your partners, uh, especially if you, if you see a topic. Uh, again, we're going to try to get the topics out ahead of time that might be of interest to your partners um, in, in, in Public, the public safety and other towing community that can participate. I see some towing folks on here, but um, I think we need to have some uh, public safety folks, firefighters and law enforcement, uh, participate in these. Um, and you know, you can often do that through some of your, your TIM committees. So um, thanks again, Jack. Really appreciate it. And um, uh, we uh, look forward to hearing from you again. Next up is um, KJ Kripiel from um, uh, Nebraska, Highway Emergency Management Program Specialist at, at the, the, the DOT there um, in, out of Lincoln, Nebraska. He's a retired Air Force Emergency Manager, um, so he's, uh, he's uh, helped defend this nation um, in his service. Appreciate that. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Education and Applied Science in Emergency Management. Um, and um, he's uh, been responsible for a lot of Tim um, training improvements in Nebraska. I um, I was uh, um, very honored to be invited to an all-day executive meeting that they had out there for Tim as sort of their executive committee to talk about how it, we can advance the traffic incident management in the state of Nebraska. And I was pleasantly surprised to hear about some of some of the new activities. That was a few months ago. So I, I thought um, Nebraska would be a, a great program to feature today because, um, you know, they've done some that I was not aware of, and shame on me. So with that, TJ, take it over. Thank you, Paul. Um, very honored to be presenting today. Um, didn't know really what within our training to share, so I'm just going to kind of uh, share really a summarization of what we do. Hopefully some people can pick up on some of the things we're doing, and maybe it'll help out. By no means or do we feel like we're a Great, we feel like we're doing good, but we're always looking to improve. Um, but to go over some of our challenges and successes, um, I'd like to share that today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just kind of talk about really some basic things uh, as a trainer, um, some things that I've seen in what we used to call in the military is death by PowerPoint. Um, that's just, I, I would rather have our instructors kind of lead in a facilitation way to where we get responders to be able to share their stories and some of their struggles or issues or what have you. So, and, and this really works better um, in our state we, when we're working with a lot of volunteer fire departments in the evening. You know, they've already worked all day, they're tired, um, so, you know, getting them involved in the discussion kind of, yeah, it keeps them, keeps them awake. And then, of course, my next bullet there, using humor if possible, you know, when, pos when it's appropriate. Um, that sometimes helps as well. Um, uh, good instructors, um, I don't mean to say that I have any bad instructors. Um, I, I just want them to be, you know, try to get better. Um, when we, uh, I kind of have that same, probably about the same national percentage of instructors that are teaching, uh, probably around 23%. So obviously, when we're doing a new train the trainer, I want to make sure that we vet those people that want to be trainers. Why do they want to be trainer? Um, have they trained before? You know, are they comfortable in front of, uh, you know, speaking in front of people? Um, so we vet them a little bit, just make sure that they're willing. They realize that it's unpaid. Uh, that 
we would want them to travel a little bit in their area to help out and teach classes. Um, location, um, know your state and time of year events. Um, I know most people probably already know this, but I just wanted to state, you know, Nebraska is a lot different than California. I've been to most states in the country uh, throughout my military career, um, so I, I, I realize that. Um, so, you know, my, my point is know your state. You know, we have a lot of rural area, farming community, things like that. So it's important to know when the planting season ends, when, when's harvest, because um, a lot of those farmers um, are on our volunteer fire department. So, I mean, they're, they're not going to be as available. So uh, to get a good sized class and to try to get maximum participation, we try to stay away from those areas. Um, I, hunting season, another one that, that comes to mind. Major events, you know, what kind of major events you have in your state. Um, we, have, we host the College World Series in Omaha every year, so, you know, we stay away from that uh, June time frame. Um, and then, of course, weather, you know. Well, we've got all kinds of different weather throughout the year, so that, of course, impacts uh, when we can schedule training and, and do our training. Scheduling. Um, Date time flexibility, you know, I just, I think we try to be very flexible uh, to do the training or to try to find instructors to do the training when it's best for the agency, the, the department. Um, that just seems to work well. It doesn't always work if, if we can't get instructors during that time, but uh, m most of the time we do. So um, one thing that, that I do, uh, and, and I'd just like to share is I, I map my state uh, as co according to my training records. I use uh, Google Earth, and basically I can put uh, on a layer, I can put which agencies uh, by county have had the training. Um, this helps me with maybe looking at that map and targeting areas that, um, especially if they're along the I-80 corridor or something like that, and they haven't had training, we need to probably get them the training. But it just gives you a good visual. It also helps me when scheduling. If, if a town calls me and, and you know, I'm, where is that town, you know? I pull it up on my map, and then they want to host training. I can look in their area and see if there's others, other agencies, towns in that area that maybe haven't had the training yet, or maybe they haven't had it in quite a while, and just let them know to invite them as well. So again, it's trying to maximize the size of my classes. Um, that works really, really well for us. Um, Coordination, basically, again, this is probably, uh, everybody's probably already doing this, but um, as the TIM coordinator, you know, I, I want to be the central contact for TIM training. Um, every now and then I'll, I'll get a roster in the mail of a class I didn't even know was going on. Uh, you know, I've got trainers out there, they're, they're leaning forward and they're doing everything they're supposed to, but I'd really like them to let me know that they're having a class because, again, if somebody contacted me and maybe they just have one or two people that need the training that missed, you know, maybe when they had it previously. Um, if there's going to be one in the area, uh, those people want to know about it. So it's kind of just good for me to know, uh, you know, what training is going on. Last on this slide, you know, reaching out to get your buy-in or to get classes set up. Face-to-face -face works really well in Nebraska, um, but it's not always possible. Uh, we're a fairly large state, um, but if, you know, if I'm out and about, I, I you know, I try. I do stop by fire departments and visit with them. Um, I usually give them a, a handout a flyer of, of the training. Um, word of mouth works really, really well. Um, if we've done training in a class and and their feedback was, you know, hey, this is really good training. I say, well, you know, spread the word. Uh, tell you tell other agencies around your town, other towns around. Uh, let them know because we can sure come back to this area and do another class. Email. If I sometimes I get contacts, I'll get an email, so I email direct. But um, every probably maybe oh every couple months, maybe quarterly, I email uh, county emergency managers uh, just to kind of remind them that we have this free, free training for responders, and and uh, and those usually produce some classes as well, so that that tends to work. And of course, phone calls. Um, we we set up an expo table at uh, two events annually. Uh, we, our towing and recovery community has a, a Nebraska tow show that's uh, the first weekend in June, and so they, they have a bunch of different um, tables out, and they don't charge us because we don't we're not really a company selling anything. Um, 
And, I, and then I've added a, a sign-up sheet just to get people's contact information if they're interested in training. Um, our uh, volunteer, Nebraska Volunteer Fire Association has a fire school. It's a three or four day weekend. Uh, it's usually the weekend before uh, Memorial Day in May. And they have a, a big expo area as well, and so I have a table there as well. We usually uh, have a Tim class at that as well uh, that, that I help instruct. But that table, again, you know, have a sign-up sheet and things like that. And then um, last there it says free stuff. Well, this is something that we've been doing in Nebraska for quite a while. Is we, uh, if it's a public agency, we provide them with a traffic kit. Um, initially, that kit consisted of uh, two signs, uh, five collapsible cones, and six uh, retroreflective five-point breakaway vests. Um, we used, when I got here, uh, the criteria was to have six personnel in a class. Well, I found over a few years that um, there would be six people from an agency, and I would ask them, well, how, how many do you have in your department? They'd say, oh, 43. And I'm thinking, really? And only six could make it, huh? Uh, and they're, you know, and maybe they're hosting the thing. So uh, what we did this last year is change that to 60%. That also makes it better for smaller um, agencies. Uh, you know, maybe an agency of only eight people, you know, for them to get six is maybe a little more difficult. So we thought a percentage would be better. We also uh, allowed them to uh, break those kits up but keeping in the same dollar value, uh, basically two more sets of cones equals one sign. So we kind of let them uh, have a little bit of flexibility there as well. <clears throat> so beyond the initial training, the four hour, um, one thing that we've uh, been doing for the last few years in our um, some of the areas is, is media training. Uh, we do a two hour session uh, for the, the media. Um, as many of you know, when you turn on the news, it's usually the most new person on the news that maybe you haven't seen, they just got out of college and they're on the side of the road, usually have their back to traffic, not wearing a safety vest. Uh, we we, uh, we thought that was a problem as well as we've heard from the responders in the Omaha Metro that uh, sometimes where they were setting up was not safe or they were in the way of the responders. So this training has been really good. Um, we, you know, you turn on the news now and those, those people have their safety vests on and they're uh, setting up their, their I think they do it through Twitter. Um, they're, they're looking at the Twitter, and somehow they're, they're finding out uh, where to set up. But it's working really well in Omaha. Exercises. Um, we had one kind of a major exercise out in North Platte. Uh, they're a very uh, proactive group. Um, it was, I would say there's crawl, walk, and run phase. It was maybe between a crawl and a, run, a walk phase. Um, but we had maximum participation. Um, it was a great opportunity. We got our towing partners there to bring out some crash cars. Um, just really good. We could stop things and kind of ask questions, but it really helped with uh, the, the different disciplines, understanding what other agencies are doing and why they're doing it. Um, another thing I do is I mix it in with maybe refresher training. If I go back to a town and, and they've already had it, but it's been a few years and they got some new people, um, rather, again, than having death by PowerPoint, I cover some of the new things that, uh, or, you know, the, the main content of, of traffic incident management, but we go ahead and do uh, some hands-on tabletop, get the cars out, um, do some situational stuff. If the, we usually do it around when the weather's nice and we got some daylight if it's in the evening still. Um, we'll go set up cones, look at buffer zones, things like that. So that, this, I think exercise really help you validate your training and, and plans and, and help to identify areas of improvement. So I can't say enough about using exercises. Uh, this slide, I just kind of want to, again, just give you a little bit of a, a footprint of Nebraska. I, I could have got a map, but I thought you'd enjoy the popcorn more. Um, but we have I-80, Interstate 80, that runs east-west and west-east uh, throughout our whole state through the panhandle. Um, so that's our main corridor. We also have uh, Highway 81 that turns into 35 in Kansas that runs from Can uh, all the way from Canada to Texas. So we have that intersection as well. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about seasons. You know, winter we have snow, blizzards. Um, that, that really causes a, a lot of headaches um, for training. You know, again, you know, we, we always, <laughs> always kind of say, 
you know, weather permitting, you know, we schedule it, but of course, if weather gets bad, everybody understands that we may have to postpone that training. In the spring, we have flooding, and, and of course, our tornado season starts. Uh, this last March, we basically had a, a, a perfect storm, if you will. We had uh, a terrible blizzard in the panhandle, which is probably 20, 24 inches of snow blowing for a couple days, so we couldn't get I-80 open. Uh, it ended up being closed basically half of the state uh, west. And then uh, we had a bunch of snow on the ground in, in the middle of the state, north, north central, and we warmed up and we had four inches of rain that came down. Melted all that snow, I, I think like 20 inches of snow is about another inch and a half of rain. And uh, because the snow was on the ground, the ground was uh, frozen. There was no absorption into the ground, so it was all runoff. Uh, we had historic flooding. Uh, just to give you an example, the Elkhorn River in uh, it, that's just west of Omaha, it crested five feet some odd inches above the historic level. So just we've had a lot of damage, bridges. I think we ended up losing 15 bridges uh, in some extent, not, not necessarily floating down the river, but approaches and things like that. Summertime, we, again, we have the College World Series in Omaha. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people that, that fly in or drive in for that, but a lot of Nebraskans, even though if our college team's not playing there, a lot of Nebraskans enjoy baseball and they like to go to that, so that's something big. Of course, construction, a lot of times they say in Nebraska there's only two seasons, winter and construction, but a lot of that's still going on, you know, it's going on throughout the summer. Fall, um, Nebraska football, uh, that's a lot of traffic into Lincoln, uh, from Omaha to Lincoln and from western Nebraska. Um, we just have a rel relatively large stadium and a lot of people travel for that. And then, of course, harvest in the fall. So again, this is just, you know, kind of knowing your state and, and what, you know, the makeup of it and how that is going to affect your training. Lastly, I'd like to talk about um, our working groups. We have three working groups. Uh, Omaha Council Bluff was the first that started several years ago. and. They, they have great participation. They meet, uh, they were meeting monthly, now they meet every two months. Um, they debrief some incidents, look at lessons learned, things like that. And we really had some good things come out of those. Southeast Nebraska group, which includes Lincoln. And then one of our newer ones that started a couple years ago, West Central, uh, not our panhandle, but that's why they kind of called it West Central, the I-80 corridor there. Um, we've had, uh, we skipped Central Nebraska because we've had more uh, incidents uh, out west, but our next group will be in uh, central Nebraska, and then probably after that will be the Panhandle. We'll have all of I-80 corridor kind of uh, grouped for uh, working groups. But those uh, those have worked out really really well for us. Um, we through the efforts of that we we got funding for a safety service vehicle for the Omaha Metro. Um, so just you know we we see that that work uh, really helps and, and it matters. But that, that's all I've got. Thank you. TJ, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Really appreciate it and really appreciate um, the reminder about some of the uh, training strategies is, uh, is always uh, near and dear to um, Jim and my heart. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> really, really appreciate that. So um, just, uh, you know, it's great to see the Tim, Tim committees for everyone on the call here, you know, keep pushing those Tim committees. They're very, very important, multidisciplinary committees, getting everyone together to continuously move things and move things forward. Uh, you know, when I was uh, invited to Oma, to Nebraska for that meeting I mentioned earlier, um, I was trying to book all the hotels, trying to, trying to book a hotel in Omaha because I was going to fly out of Omaha the next morning. And Three hundred dollar rooms is what what I was finding. I'm saying, what the heck is going on there? I can find a room in New York City cheaper than I can in, in Omaha, and it was because of the World Series was going on, the College World Series. So um, I was I had to go elsewhere. But um, anyways, um, so uh, TJ, I'll just ask you a quick question. The the uh, the call uh, the, um, the the committee that's in Omaha. Um, uh, Oak Bluffs there is that that's with uh, in conjunction with some folks in Iowa is that correct? Yes, that's uh, Council Bluff Omaha metro area. Um, I, I would guess the metro area is probably a million people, uh, but yeah, we we that's a two state. Um, 
And then we participate up in uh, Sioux City in a tri-state group, but that one's facilitated by Iowa DOT. Okay, excellent, excellent, appreciate it. Okay, so any anyone else, um, if you could just chat some questions in the chat pod if you have them. If you don't, that's that's all well and good. Questions are not required, but um, but of interest. But I'll, while we're doing that, I have a question for Jack. Um, uh, Jack, if you're still on, um, you know, you showed us all fire trucks and fire vehicles. Uh, can, can this stuff be used on other responder vehicles as well? you want to comment on that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, we get questions all the time from people. Are they allowed to use the chevrons that are on the back of fire trucks? There's nothing exclusive about those chevrons for fire apparatus. They can be used on any vehicles. Uh, Grady can comment on the fact that he was able to, for at least a short time, get those chevrons incorporated on the back of some of the Florida Highway Patrol vehicles. I don't know whether they're still doing it or not. Uh, a number of safety service patrols are using high visibility graphics on the back of their vehicles that uh, match the chevron pattern and color combination that you see on the back of fire apparatus. Uh, anybody can use it, and uh, as I indicated in my section, um, I think the real goal is to make sure that whatever color combination and pattern that you use uh, meets that test of fluorescent and reflective. Excellent. So something to consider, uh, you know, when you, you know, that's a, to me it's a low-cost item to, uh, to en enhance safety. So I um, see some folks are typing in the chat pod, so I'll just wait a second and see if... Uh, I don't see any questions. Did I miss anything? Paul, well, um, I see a couple oh, yeah. in the bottom. Oh, yeah, I had to scroll yeah. down. Yeah, I had to scroll down a couple of things. Uh, thanks to Rebecca Brewster for reminding me that, but I've reached out to just about everybody that the Tim capability capability maturity self assessments to do this Friday. Um, for those of you. Uh, that haven't done them yet, I'll be calling. So um, please, uh, please get them in. Uh, for those of you that didn't do one this year, we still have a little bit of time. Um, in my opinion, almost every, just about every working group should should do one at least occasionally. Um, we we require the top 75 metro areas to do it. Um, require is not the exact right word, but something like that. So, um, so uh, you know, that's a reminder on that. Um, so. Um, for uh, I see that uh, Captain John Paul Cartier of Arizona um, uh, DPS has a question for um, for Jack Sullivan. What has been the testing or response from DOT organizations on lighting technologies? Have you ventured into other disciplines much? Which is along the lines of my question. But you see qu his question in there, Jack. Yeah, um, I, I would say that for the last uh, six or seven years, we have been actively seeking assistance with funding for additional studies on emergency lighting and the uh, graphics and conspicuity issue in general, um, there is actually more formal studies that have been done on amber and yellow warning lights than those that have been done in a general nature on uh, red and blue warning lights for law enforcement, fire, and EMS. Um, the biggest problem we've had is that nobody has been able to pony up the money needed to do the type of testing that everybody would like to see um, that's more formalized and a little bit more scientifically based. Uh, we are currently negotiating with FEMA right now on a grant to do uh, a next level study to kind of build on what we learned out of the study that we did in Harrisburg in November of 2018. Uh, hopefully we'll get something out of that, but we already know that the amount of money that's needed to do the type of study that we'd like to see done uh, is not going to be available from that particular source, and we're still looking for assistance from any entity, DOT or otherwise, uh, that can help support the type of studies that we need to provide specific scientific uh, evidence and recommendations on the most effective warning light um, strategies to use out at roadway incidents. Uh, there's still much work to be done, no question about it. Great, thanks, thanks, Jack. Uh, Claire Bozic has has offered a good question. Um, I'm going to let TJ take it, but there's probably many people on the call can take this, and I would I will um, I will um, 
I will um, chime in myself on that. So, TJ, what, what's the level of folks that participate on those committees? Um, on our working group, um, I would say the just probably by the nature that Omaha has been doing it the longest, they, they just really have a great showing. Um, you know, if, if one agency missed a meeting, they're usually at the next one. I, you know, I think we have really good participation. Um, uh, believe it or not, our North Platte group, our, our West Central group, probably is a little stronger than our Southeast Nebraska group. Um, and, and we don't, I don't, I, well, some people tell me it's because Lincoln, the Lincoln um, responders uh, don't uh, respond that often to I-80. Of course, the fire department does, but the, the police don't. Um, so sometimes they don't feel like they're really a part of this. Um, but out West Central, uh, they, they've had so many really bad uh, crashes that they really have been proactive. And so they're, they're a very active group. Did that okay. kind of um, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a shot at a question. Um, so typically, Claire, what we've seen throughout the country, my experience in Massachusetts and with many, many other committees throughout the country, um, it's it's usually mid-level managers. Um, occasionally, you'll get someone up. So, so uh, you know, you'll get a you know a, um, a maintenance engineer from a DOT. You'll get a, a state police, or, a, or I shouldn't say just state police, a, a police sergeant or a lieutenant, for example. Um, firefighters the same rank, sort of uh, not not necessarily the you know the, 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 the firefighter one, but but someone at, at a lieutenant's level, a captain. Um, it's usually the, you know, the, the committees vary throughout the country. Some have strong participation with the agencies. Um, you, know, with, you know, sometimes, you know, you struggle to get a fire agency there or the right agency, the biggest agency is not participating. But then others have, have full, strong participation. Um, the same thing with, with all the disciplines. So, um, but usually it's the general, you know, the, you know, people with influence within an agency is ideal, but not necessarily the, you know, the senior managers. So. Hope that helps, uh, Claire. And please, if you, if uh, if um, you need some help standing up a committee or working with a committee, Jim and I are, are happy to work with you. So, um, are there uh, so for Eric, uh, have you had any ex another one from J.P. Um, uh, John Paul Cut? Cartier, uh, a New England Patriots fan, a fellow New England Patriots fan, by the way. Um, Eric, do you have, any, have you experienced any pushback or concerns from the towing industry, towing organizations, legislatures with your selection process built for that criteria, that program you were talking about? Oh, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, John, um, I'm not aware of any, you know, concerns or pushback. Um, we've undergone, I think, the third iteration of our STAR program. Uh, we started the STAR um, Specialty Towing and Roadside Repair Program in 2009. Um, since that time, we, we've we really just kind of refined the process. Um, so I think if, if there have been any concerns shared with, you know, our team or with us uh, through towing organizations of the industry, we've incorporated some of their feedback into the program. Um, the, the part about the program, we, we're, our system split up in a number of sectors, and so um, what I'd like to think is that we have 12 sectors that provide an opportunity for different towers around the state. You know, we have two or three interested in South, some of the South Florida sectors. We might have three or four interested in the Central Florida sectors, and, and there's different opportunities for them to um, apply and um, try and be part of the process. It's a request for proposals, so they'll submit proposals, and we'll have a technical review committee um, comprised generally of three people that review their proposals. So I'm not aware of any major concerns um, at this point. So another another one from Rebecca Brewster, um, Eric. Uh, do operators in the STAR program go through uh, uh, the National Tim Responder Training Program? Good question, Rebecca. Good question. We do have a high level of expectations on training. I am not 100% sure about the National TIM training course. 
but I know that um, we definitely have some, some high expectations for them. So they need to be TRAA uh, certified, um, all their operators. So uh, I'm going to look into the National TIM training course, but we, we definitely make those courses available for all of our vendors, um, to, my, to my understanding. Thanks, Eric. That's a good question. You know, some some organizations um, have, you know, throughout the country, some police, uh, you know, and, and people that control towing have actually made the, the, the four-hour um, Shop 2 training a requirement. So uh, we, th we think it's a great strategy um, to do that. Remember, towers get get um, getting hit, uh, killed, and, and struck by uh, injuries uh, at a higher rate than every, all the other disciplines. So, Paul, we do, we do expect the national 10 training courses to be followed. Yeah, we do. So. Other questions? Uh, a couple other questions. Jim's, uh, please read Jim's. Um, uh, I was going to let you talk, Jim. You want to you wanna chime in for a second, Jim? Yeah, Paul, I was just uh, kudos to uh, TJ, his presentation, all the presentations. But to the point I was making earlier, you know, when we started, the the 23 percent, and um, I would ask our stakeholders on the line, you know, if, you know, within their sphere of influence, if you're aware or can get in contact with your TIM committee uh, and, and, you know, maybe contact you know, reach out to your inactive trainers and ask them, you know, if they would engage in the training. They could refresh by taking the the four-hour course online or, or just team up again and maybe consider training. And as you know, Paul, we get, or we know, we have several states that have been uh, replenishing their, their bench by conducting their own state-led train-to-trainer workshops, which is a great practice and, um, a good thing for sure. So thanks, Paul. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, here's a question for uh, for TJ as well. On average, how many Tim for our classroom responder sessions are held in Nebraska per month? That's a hard question because <laughs> I know the months probably vary. I think you said that in your presentation, TJ. Are you still there? Oh, sorry, I thought I had my mute off. Yeah, um, it uh, it does vary a little bit, like I said in my presentation. Uh, because this year we had such bad flooding, and that flooding has continued throughout the summer, um, Not a good, this year is not a good example. So, so over the last three and a half years that I've been here, I would say we probably average anywhere from two to four a month. Um, but again, some months that could be a little higher. Um, around the holidays, it could be... We're, we're, I think I have one scheduled in December now, and that might be the only one I get this, uh, scheduled. But yeah, it just varies a little bit. But I think yeah, a few more people typing. I'll give it a couple of. Uh, um, well, yeah, no one has that information right now, but I'll ask TJ anyways. Do you have uh, to keep statistics on on improved safety? Um, that's a struggle, Clay, to get everyone to, to collect the data. So, um, DJ, you don't have any stats on that, do you? Um, not, not that I, I don't. Not, not that I'm aware of. We have some information on that, but it's a, it's a long story, Clay. I would be happy to share it with you uh, <laughs> offline. So, but we, we do have, um, you know. Some examples where we, where, you know, the problem is people, people don't um, necessarily collect the data. That's right, Clay. But but folks are collecting the data now. We we you know last last years we've been getting uh, the the, um, the temp performance measures on the crash reports, and increasingly the TMCs are collecting the data. A few CAD uh, operations are doing it as well. So um, we are we are heading in the right direction, but it's been a then it's been a slow fist fight, if you will. So, any other questions, thoughts? I see, we're losing. Okay, so I think we'll wrap it up. Um, I 
Now, I thought we had one more slide here on just a reminder about next next month. Yep, this next month. Um, you know, this was a great session. I, Jim and I always have a ball uh, with with these. Uh, you guys are all doing great work out there. We really appreciate you know you do you being advocates for uh, traffic incident management and um, you know the, the the extreme benefits that they provide for safety for starters and then for every you know a lot of other things that we know. Um, Paul, right, we, yes. Yeah, if I could just repeat my ask of earlier, and it's really from you and me, if, uh, and similar to what you were alluding to before, just trying to get uh, our stakeholders here to share this the information, the links. Uh, we we blast out to several hundred uh, of of you, the champions of the Tim community, national Tim community, but. Moving forward, if we could ask you to make a harder ask to to your partners from all the disciplines uh, to to participate in these webinars, Paul and I would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but I, I do think that we had 135 people at one time, and I know there was multiple people on a few calls, so it's very respectable. But um, you know, we it is. You know, yeah, but the more the merrier, and um, uh, we we do. A There's one comment in here by Sean Kenny, who is the Tim program in Florida. He's a big program in Florida, but he uh, recommended to the Florida Highway Patrol that the Shop Two training be added to the next version of the Administrative Code 15B9, the record qualification system, basically. Um, following, I'd say there's at least a half a dozen state patrols that have required the training. So. Uh, that's a good thing to go after in, after in your state is to recommend that uh, if your state doesn't do that, that um, it can that can help help with the numbers and uh, and they did in Illinois. That's right, Claire. That's right. They actually made a legislation uh, in in Illinois. So um, great. So with that, a reminder about next month is on your screen. I won't read it all to you. Uh, there's a link there, but we'll be sending out emails to all of you as well. But um, we expect uh, we, this was a, a great event. We enjoyed it, and um, we expect that next month will be the same. So with that, be safe out there, and um, thank you for all that you do. With that, we'll uh, close it up. Thanks very much.